Debbie Stone. California native Deborah Stone was born in 1956 and was a beautiful, talented, and smart woman. In 1974, the soon-to-be Iowa State University freshman applied for a summer job at Disneyland, one of her favorite places in the world. She landed the hostess position at Disneyland's newest attraction, America Sings. In it, a rotating carousel-like stage featuring singing animatronics would entertain the audience singing songs about America's history. Just nine days after its opening, on July 8, 1974, Debbie was in the middle of an evening shift at the attraction. That day, she had called her parents and told them that she was in love and wanted the permission to get engaged. Her parents were thrilled for her. At around 10.30 p.m., the night's last show was about to end, and the stages were shifting positions. Suddenly, a guest heard a blood-curdling scream. By the time operators rushed to the scene, they discovered Debbie Stone had been crushed between the theater's walls. There are plenty of theories to explain exactly what happened that tragic night. Some believe Debbie fell into the stage as she leaned in to talk to a fellow cast member, or that she tripped while trying to jump from one stage to another. Perhaps she got distracted and stepped into the system without noticing until it was too late. After the grisly incident, Disneyland shut down the ride for a couple of days. The exact stage where Debbie perished stayed closed for an entire year. Stone's parents sued Disneyland. Following the tragedy, Disney engineers installed sensory lights that warned the attraction's operator if someone or something got too close to the walls. The ride remained open for another 14 years, until 1988. Since the tragic accident that took Debbie's life, several cast members and guests have claimed that they have seen her ghost. Some even reported that they've heard a warm, soothing voice warning, quote, Be careful. Abandoned Parks On Walt Disney World's official map, there are two abandoned islands in the middle of Bay Lake. These mysterious territories, which were once fully functioning parks, are now closed to the public. Still, some brave urban explorers have ventured into them. River Country Water Park opened in June 1976 and was one of Walt Disney World's first major additions after the park opened in 1971. If not the first fully themed water parks ever built, one of the first fully themed water parks had a rustic wilderness theme. Walt Disney himself referred to it as a, quote, Tom Sawyer's swimming hole. It included several large water slides, a lazy river, a sand lake, and a massive play area for children. The park was known for its bespoke filtration system, which used water from the adjacent Bay Lake. The water was filtered and then used in river country. The water park was a staple of Florida's Disney World lineup for a quarter of a century. It inspired other companies to create their own water attractions. By 2001, the park's lineup had expanded to three more theme parks, over 30 hotels, and two more water parks, Typhoon Lagoon, which opened in 1989, and Blizzard Beach, opened in 1995. With time, River Country became basically obsolete, and attendance began to suffer. It closed in November 2001 for its annual winter refurbishment, but didn't reopen with the two other parks. At first, Disney remained silent on the issue before releasing an official statement in 2002 that it would remain closed for the entire year. Finally, in 2005, Disney announced that after 29 years, River Country was closed for good. Several theories surrounding River Country's closure have floated around online ever since. In the 1980s, a child contracted a fatal case of meningoencephalitis from the park's water, sourced from the adjoining lake. Did Disney close the park in fear that this brain-eating amoeba would infect other tourists? Another abandoned Disney park is Discovery Island, a small zoological park that dwindled in popularity after Animal Kingdom opened in 1998. After these parks' closure, Disney uncharacteristically did not demolish them. Instead, they put fences around the area and left it to rot. These sites have attracted plenty of urban explorers who illegally break into the area and share the footage of the crumbling abandoned parks now filled with mold and rot. Some of the parks still have cast member pictures, and others, strangely, reptiles in jars. FBI Informant For more than 25 years, Walt Disney secretly aided the FBI's Los Angeles office. As an outside agent, Mr. Disney reported on suspected illicit political inclinations of Hollywood actors, writers, producers, directors, technicians, and union activists from 1940 until he died in 1966. At the time, communism was on the rise, and American officials were worried that these ideals would spread into society. 
J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, and Walt Disney struck up a long friendship. Their relationship began when Disney informed Hoover that Soviet infiltration had caused his animators to go on strike in 1941. According to the animators' union leaders, the strike was caused by Walt's unjust firing of several employees for union activism. But their boss disagreed. According to his 1947 House Un-American Activities Committee's testimony, communists caused the strike. In return for this valuable cooperation, Hoover allowed Disney cameras inside the FBI's headquarters. Walt Disney was eventually promoted to special agent. The FBI also helped Disney with the permits for the construction of Disneyland in Los Angeles, and contributed to the creation of Tomorrowland, an area of the park with numerous attractions that depict futuristic landscapes. Hoover himself also read several of Disney's upcoming project scripts and edited out the parts he didn't like. In 1961, Hoover collaborated on writing the script for the Disney film Moon Pilot. The earliest communication between the two men appears to have happened in the summer of 1936. Still, information about Walt's role as an informant wasn't released to the public until 1993 as part of the Freedom of Information Act. Almost 600 pages detailing Disney's involvement with the FBI were released, but most of the specific details were blacked out. Thus, it's impossible to know precisely which famous names were reported to Mr. Disney's federal agents. Ashes to Ashes All Disney parks are famous destinations for significant life events, from marriage proposals to birthdays. But it turns out, many people want their ashes to be spread there, too. Several guests often visit Disney World in Orlando, Florida, and Disneyland in Anaheim, California, to sprinkle a loved one's ashes around the park's attractions. The most popular rides were Guest Attempt the Morbid Act, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dumbo, It's a Small World, and most notably, the Haunted Mansion. According to Disney officials, this type of behavior is strictly forbidden. If they're caught, they're immediately escorted out of the park's premises and banned for life. These illicit acts have happened since the early 1990s, and over the years, people have gotten creative. They've gone as far as hiding ashes in Ziploc bags, pill bottles, and even empty makeup containers. Without written permission, scattering human ashes on private property is a misdemeanor violation of the state health and safety code. Still, there's not much that authorities can do to enforce the law. Officials say the ashes pose no real health threat. The scattering of human ashes has become so commonplace that Disney staff members have a particular code name for handling it. It's referred to as a HEPA cleanup, which references the ultra-fine vacuum used to suck the ashes up. When ashes are discovered, the attraction has to be closed because of technical difficulties. A staff member then has to ride through the attraction alone and sweep up and vacuum all the remains. But these particles are so minuscule, there's no doubt that more than one unknowing guest has inhaled some of these ashes straight into their lungs. Exactly how many human ashes remain at the Disney parks today, it's impossible to tell. Lemming Lie Disney's 1958 documentary White Wilderness earned the company an Academy Award, as well as worldwide recognition. This nature documentary depicts the wildlife in the snowy northern portions of North America. But its most shocking part was the clips featuring the death of lemmings who drowned after jumping off cliffs and into the sea. The problem, the poor critters were actually pushed to their untimely deaths. In 1982, almost 25 years after the film's release, the TV show The Fifth Estate broadcast a documentary about Hollywood animal cruelty called Cruel Camera. Bob McEwen, the host of the show, discovered that the ominous lemming scene was actually filmed at the Bow River near downtown Calgary, not in the Arctic Ocean as mentioned in the film. According to a cameraman on the documentary's production team, the filmmakers paid local children of the Manitoba province in Canada to collect lemmings. They put them in cages to transport them to a filming location south of their natural habitat. Crew members constructed a device consisting of spinning turntables, which were then covered in snow. The lemmings would walk onto the snow, and as the machine began to turn around, the defenseless animals would be thrown off the cliff. The footage was then edited to make this mass animal slaughter look like a natural suicide. The host of the program also interviewed a lemming expert, who declared that the lemming species shown in White Wilderness did not usually migrate, much less commit mass suicide by throwing themselves off a cliff. Footage from the same documentary, where a polar bear cub falls down an arctic ice slope, was actually filmed in a Canadian film studio. In 2019, the documentary was featured on Disney+, Plus, but after the news about the lemming suicides being intentional was spread around the internet, it was quickly pulled off the streaming platform. It is still unknown who first got the idea to kill the lemmings, but it is unlikely that it was authorized by Walt Disney himself. 